section of the gospel that Deacon Edges read is a section there where Mahatma Gandhi, the famous Hindu, said, if Christians really live that way, I'd become a Christian. And it's, it is challenging, isn't it? Jesus says, love your enemies, not just tolerate them, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. It's quite a challenge. You wonder, is Jesus really serious about this? Let's look at what he says. He quotes the Jewish law of equivalent retribution, okay? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was actually a huge improvement for the Jewish people. Before that, vengeance went beyond the crime committed. So before that, if my neighbor stole one of my sheep, I might kill all of his sheep. Uh, so a law of equal justice was a huge improvement. But Jesus says we have to go way beyond that to a response of mercy and of forgiveness. And he gives us three famous examples. First of all, you know, we're used to hearing that faced with dangers, humans can either respond with fight or flight. But Jesus proposes a third way for us that's neither fight nor flight. Um, he says, when someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn and offer him the other as well. Do a little bit of demonstration, okay? Morgan, would you come up, please? <laughs> I owe her so big time after this, so big time. I'm sure this is her last day of being an altar server. <laughs> okay, so what Jesus is talking about is um, striking on the right cheek, that's her right cheek, right? Would be done with the back of the hand. Um, only right hands were used for social interactions. That kind of a slap was regarded as far more insulting than a normal slap. It was a way that a master would treat their slave. It was meant to humiliate, not to injure, but to humiliate. So if I hit Morgan like that, that's a to with my back of my hand, it's a total humiliation. But Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Notice now I can no longer hit her with the back of my hand. I have to use, if I want to continue this, the front of my hand, <laughs> which that's what two equals do. Two equals hit each other with the face of their hand like that. So Jesus is taking it away from the relationship of a slave to a master and putting it in the relationship of two equals, okay? Morgan, I can never pay you back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, sir. She did a great job, didn't she? Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so what you're doing there is robbing the aggressor of his power to humiliate you and shaming him, inviting him to repent. Suing over your tunic, okay? Jewish men wore two garments, an inner garment called the tunic, and then the outer garment was heavier, called the cloak. One could not be sued for his cloak because that was your blanket at night to keep you warm if you were uh, poor, so you couldn't take anybody's cloak. So when Jesus says, uh, by the way, remember on the cross, they stripped Jesus, took all of his clothes, and his tunic, his inner garment, there were the soldiers cast lots for it, because it was seamless. There was no seam. So, I don't know if a blessed mother made it, whoever made it, it was amazing. So it was valuable, they cast lots for it. So if someone takes your, your tunic and your cloak, then you would be naked. And someone responsible for a person's nakedness would be gravely humiliated. So to give them both your coat and your tunic would be a powerful message to them of their avarice and of their greed. In other words, it would be an invitation to repent, like, wow, this is way too much. I, I'm over the edge here. i got to back off. It would be an invitation to repent. Finally, going the extra mile, a Roman soldier had the right to force someone to carry his equipment for up to one mile and no more. Going a second mile puts that Roman soldier in a difficult position. He could be severely punished by his superiors for abusing his authority. By going the second mile, you're making the Roman treat you as an equal. You're saying, this is not forced obedience. This is my gift to you treating him as an equal. Actually, all three of these do that. But Jesus is calling his listeners 
to break that cycle of violence to a new cycle of generosity and love, even of one's enemies, which will actually invite one's enemies to stop being one's enemies. And of course, as in all things, Jesus doesn't just talk about this, he does it. We call it the cross, right? He does what he's talking about. His cross, notice, is a response to evil that's neither fight nor flight. Remember what Jesus said to Pilate? If I wanted, I could have legions of angels come and protect me. He chose not to fight, chose not to flee. Remember, his apostles said, don't go to Jerusalem, they hate you there. But he set his face to Jerusalem. But well, Jesus chose neither fight nor flight. So his response is a refusal to resist evil. It's a response of sacrificing love. On the cross, he does what he tells us to do, right? Remember how he said, pray for your persecutors? What's he say on the cross? Forgive them, Father. They do not know what they're doing. He prays for his persecutors. On the cross, he stops that cycle of sin and violence, and he washes it away in his blood, and he redeems our world forever. And while we probably won't get slapped with the back of someone's hand or sued over our clothes or have to carry soldiers' equipment down the street, we will, all of us, meet with hatred or cruelty or false judgment of one kind or another. And to us, the words and the example of Jesus will be the same. Love your enemies. Pray for your persecutors. Do you know, something powerful happens when we pray for our persecutors in their heart and in ours. We believe in the power of prayer. So when we pray for them, we believe God is in some way going to touch them. But it changes the heart of the prayer. It changes our heart. When we start praying for our persecutor, we realize, wow, Lord, I don't know what's making them tick. They've got to be mighty and unhappy in there. So I'm just going to offer this prayer for them. Please help them any way you can. Prayer for the persecutor changes the heart of the one doing the praying. It frees him. Frees him from anger, vengeance, hatred, ruminative thoughts over and over again, which are, make us the prisoner of our persecutor. But when we pray for them, those angry thoughts, that hatred, all that bile goes away. We're no longer their prisoner. We are free. If we live that way, not returning evil for evil, but returning a blessing, it's going to bless us. If we live that way, we'll be stopping that cycle of violence, just like our Savior did, and we'll know the peace of Jesus Christ in our heart.